Today I want to talk about product market fit and how it relates to growth. Fundamentally, as startups, we all want to grow. So we're all looking for a pathway to scalable, repeatable sales. But at the same time, thank you. At the same time, we know that scaling too soon doesn't work. Uh, in fact, sometimes it can be downright dangerous. We have a set of really fundamental assumptions that we need to validate before we can efficiently and effectively step on the gas. So, how do we know when we step on the gas? So, one idea is we know when we can start focusing on scale once we've achieved product market fit. Now, Normally, at this stage in a presentation, it would be natural for me to define product market fit, but it turns out we just do not agree on how to define this whatsoever. So the term was kind of popularized by Mark Andreessen, and he defined it as product market fit is being in a good market with a product that can satisfy that market. That is so vague. And because it's so vague, whenever we talk about product market fit, it feels like almost inevitably it kind of degenerates into an argument about how do we actually define it. In my experience, whenever I talk about product market fit, we, we end up with this definition that says you just know it when you have it, which is kind of this romantic idea that it's like love. You know, we, 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 I can't tell you what it is exactly, but when you've got it, you know it. Um, interestingly, though, even though we can't agree on a definition of product market fit, we do more or less agree on what we do after we have product market fit. And more or less, we agree, once we have product market fit, then we can shift our focus to scaling and growth. I confirmed this uh, by uh, it, taking a poll amongst my unsuspecting 26,000 Twitter followers. So, uh, so I asked them this question, what do you do after you have product market fit? And I was very pleased with myself because I thought I've cleverly worded this so that I avoid us having a fight over what's the definition of product market fit. And so I said, okay, what do you do after you have product market fit? I'm so smart, we're not going to have that fight. And of course, the first nine responses I got to this was, what exactly do you mean by product market fit? Let's have a fight about that. Um, and so I said, look, people, that's not the question. I need you to answer the question the way it was phrased. Serious answers only. So then, of course, I got 19,000 responses which weren't in the least bit serious. Um, like I got this guy, Colin, what do you do after you have product market fit? He says, you instantly become afraid of losing it. <laughs> I thought, that's pretty depressing. That's a bad outlook on life. The good thing has happened and now all I can do is think about how bad it would be when I lose it. I like Nicholas better. He's like, you make a party? That's living in the moment. This is my favorite one. You walk around the park for two hours a day listening to Saster podcasts and all the good and bad things founders did, and then you ignore them all and follow your instinct. Anyways, after I got the jokers out of the way and the fighters out of the way, um, we did come to a consensus. What do you do after you have product market fit? About 82% of the 75 people that responded to that tweet said, now we're going to focus on scale. So... The next obvious question we have is, how do we know we have product market fit? If I'm waiting to have product market fit before I focus on scale, how do I know when I'm there? Um, you would expect that since we're a little vague on the definition of product market fit, we're also a little bit vague on how to measure it, but it's not too bad. Um, There's a handful of different ways that we can measure it. Uh, so some people will try to measure it with something called Net Promoter Score. You're probably familiar with that. Um, or this other one, how disappointed would you be if this product went away? Both of these are kind of measurements of customer happiness. Like how satisfied are your customers or how happy are your customers? Some people look at it in terms of churn and retention. Uh, these are all kind of like that. You know, there's the romantics again that come on this and they say, you just know. Uh, we were having a conversation about this last night over dinner. And I said, I said, you can't just know, that can't be a measurement. There's no steps to that. There's no process to that. And the guy sitting beside me at dinner said, yeah, there's a process to how you know. How you know. There's three steps. And I'm like, really? What are the three steps to you just know? He says, step one, you go to Burning Man. Step two, you consume substances. Step three, you wait for the vision. Anyway, 
that's not how you do it. I don't think, but I mean, it sounds like fun to try. You might want to try. But if you look at all the rest of these things, it's kind of a measurement of happiness. So if I have happy customers, I have product market fit. Here's the problem. In my experience, as a repeat vice president of marketing at a series of seven startups, six of those being acquired, which got me landed at five big companies, quite often we had very, very happy customers by any one of these measurements, and yet we did not know how to scale. So here's an example. Um, I worked with a company and uh, a fairly large startup, 30, 40 million revenue. And by all measurements, they looked like they had product market fit. So they had very low churn, they had really high retention, they had just done a net promoter score measurement, and their net promoter score was like around 55. So not world class, but not bad either. Um, when I talked to the CEO, I said, do you think you have product market fit? And the CEO said, absolutely, we have product market fit. Everybody's so happy with our product, we totally have it. I talked to the lead investor and I said, do you think they have product market fit? He said, absolutely, we have product market fit. We wouldn't have written them a check otherwise. Now here's where it gets funky. The growth on this company, kind of flat. And in fact, if you looked at all of the marketing and sales programs, the results of those things, not so hot. So if we're going to go fix the marketing and sales programs on this thing, the first thing I have to do as the new head of marketing is I have to figure out, you know, who are the customer we're trying to go after. So I go to the CEO and I'm like, okay, who's your ideal customer in this market? He says, ideally, we're going after Fortune 1000 companies. And I'm like, okay, uh, w what these guys actually had was a product that helped you manage internal software development projects. So I said, look, do all Fortune 1000 companies have internal software development projects? What if I'm like a mining company? They're like, yeah, 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 we take those off the list. Okay, so it's Fortune 1000 minus the mining companies. Okay, I got it. And then I said, what? hang on, I work at a tech company. I've never heard of your stuff. If you're a tech company and software is your product, would you target them? He says, no, we take those off the list too. Okay, Fortune 1000 minus the mining companies, minus the tech companies, that's your target market. He says, that's my target market. I'm like, but wait, what if I have big internal software development project and we do a lot of that, wouldn't your product help with that? He says, yeah, we might sell the occasional one like that, but it's not really in our target. But when we did the research and we looked at all their super, super happy customers, the commonality that there was amongst those customers had nothing to do with company size at all. In fact, the companies that were the happiest loved the product because it helped them solve the problem of how to manage a software development project when you had a distributed team. Why did they have a distributed team? Because they were outsourcing a lot of development offshore. So, in this case, we rejigged all the marketing and sales programs to focus just on bigger companies that were doing a lot of outsourcing. That unlocked a pile of growth and the revenue began to take off. The important point of this example is that just because you have product market fit or you think you have product market fit does not mean that you have the knowledge that you need to grow. In my experience, that it's actually kind of common. So uh, just because you have product market fit and happy customers doesn't mean you know how to grow. In my opinion, how do you know when you know how to grow? And, and in my experience, you will know when to grow when you know exactly how to grow. And uh, also in my opinion, if you are using product market fit, and, you know, if you like product market fit and you use product market fit and that's your thing, knock yourself out. I mean, keep using it. Use it for whatever you use it for. But if you are using a measurement of product market fit to try to determine when is the right point for me to start focusing on scale, I believe that is the wrong tool for the job. So what is the right tool for the job? Um, in order to scale, I need to really deeply understand who loves my stuff and why? So the previous example is a good example of that. 
if you come to me as your brand new vice president of marketing and say, hey, build me a bunch of campaigns to go after Fortune 1000 companies, I don't know how to do that. How do I target Fortune 1000 companies? Like, there's no commonality in that segment. But if you came to me and you said, build me marketing campaigns to go after companies that do an awful lot of outsourcing, now I got something to work with. I, I know where those people hang out. I know what trade shows they go to. I know there's a person inside that company that has outsourcing in their title. I can find them on LinkedIn. I can, uh, do you know there's actually a magazine called Outsourcers Magazine? <laughs> you could take a full page ad in that magazine, it costs $5,000, and these folks drove hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue just from that one tactic alone. Put another way, what this is, is what I need is an actionable segmentation. So if you're not a marketing person, what a segmentation is, is that's the way I split up a market into sub-markets that have common characteristics. An actionable segmentation means I know enough about that market in order to build marketing and sales programs to go after it. So how do I do that? Well, it turns out that's not that hard. Um, an actionable segmentation is a key component of your positioning. Positioning uh, describes how you are uniquely qualified uh, to solve a problem that a well-defined set of customers cares a lot about. That well-defined set is your actionable segmentation. There are five component pieces of positioning. You can determine them by working through them in a certain order. So it goes like this. You start by taking your happy customers. Maybe you're measuring that with net promoter score, maybe you're doing it with Sean Ellis's, would you be sad if the thing went away? You find your happiest customers and you figure out what are the true competitive alternatives for them. If you didn't exist, what would they do? The next step is you look at what features and capabilities do I have that the competitors do not have. I then translate those things into value for the customer and then I ask myself, what are the characteristics of a company that makes them really, really care a lot about my value? Until I have enough traction that I can answer that question with a certain degree of certainty, I am not yet ready to scale. Now, some of you are taking pictures of that. That's kind of a big, heavy concept. Uh, and Literally, I only have 20 minutes. So if you want to go really deep on this idea of positioning, I took some notes for you. I put it in a convenient book format. And for the price of a beer, uh, you can buy one of those and geek out all you want on positioning. Um, I'm going to give you one last story. Uh, this is um, the first company I ever worked at, straight out of university. I got a job at a company, that, a startup, that was famous for building compilers. That was their main product. But unlucky me, I was not working on the main product. I was working on this little side product thing, which was conceived as, get this, a personal use SQL database. So the thinking behind this was, if you wanted to manipulate a bunch of data, this thing you could use for your personal use. Now, this was years ago. So back then, if you wanted a full SQL database, you had to install it on a server because PCs were kind of underpowered and databases took up a lot of resources. Ours didn't, though. Ours installed really nicely on a PC. You could run it there, no problem. So we thought this thing, we were geeks. We thought, this will be amazing. Everybody wants a personal use SQL database, right? Uh, this thing's going to sell like hotcakes. We launched it into the market, and, uh, and it was a flop. And so uh, we were all bummed out about it. We spent six months trying to get the thing to work, and it never really worked. So at the end of the six months, we decided, all right, maybe we're going to can it. Like, we're making lots of money in the compiler business. This one was a failed experiment. We didn't sell that much. And so we decided before we uh, stopped servicing this product, we would call all the customers that we had and try and figure out if anybody would be really mad if we just stopped supporting it. So I got the job to call all the customers. So I called 100 customers. I did 100 customer calls. And the first 10 customer calls were laughable. So I'd call them and say, oh, hi, uh, I'm the person in charge of such and such a product. And I'm just calling to see, like, you know, how's it going with the product? And the first 10 people I called didn't even know that they had purchased the product. They were like, how do you spell it? What is it? <laughs> I was like, all right, this is going to be no problem. We can shut this thing off. Nobody cares. Problem was, customer number 10, I call them. I'm like, 
hey, I'm, this, I'm so-and-so, I'm in charge of this product. And he says, oh my God, I love that thing. I love it so much. I said, really? How come you love it so much? He says, you should see what we're doing with your product. We actually put it on a laptop. We built an application on top of it. And what, is it, what it enables us to do is we can send a salesperson out on the road and they can take a sales order, but because it's an SQL database, they bring it back to headquarters and we sync with the Oracle database. What we had to do before was the sales reps did it all pen and paper. They'd come back, they'd rekey it in, they'd make mistakes, whatever. They'd have to go back and forth. This thing is actually like we're making thousands of dollars a day by using this thing. So I said, that's cool. I guess you're going to be pissed off when I tell you I'm shutting it off. Uh, but uh, so I wrote the notes down on that. I did 100 customer calls and it turned out nine customers were using it that way and they were the only people that were happy. So I came back to the office and said, well, good news and bad news, right? Good news is, no, you know, I found nine happy customers. Bad news is they're using it for this weird thing that we never intended it to use. What do you think we should do? So we decided, let's take a run at it. So we looked at the market and said, that looks like a big market. That looks like a growing market. We know how to identify those people. Maybe we'll reposition the thing as an embeddable database for mobile devices, which we did. Um, we ran a bunch of campaigns and the thing took off. So um, we grew super, super fast. Within six months, that database product had overtaken the compiler business. Um, we had an acquisition offer from a big company in Boston, which we took, and we got acquired because of this database that was growing so fast. That company that acquired us ended up getting acquired by the biggest database company in the land at the time, which was Sybase. Um, and at the peak of its, uh, of its glory, that product, that, which was called SQL Anywhere, was a little smidge under a billion dollar business. And we almost killed it because we didn't have product market fit. The lesson here is that sometimes uh, product market fit is just not a relevant concept when you're thinking about growth. What is a relevant concept is, do I deeply, deeply understand who the customers are that love me and why, can I, and can I get to an actionable customer segmentation? So, um, I want to leave you with three things. If I could get the slide to advance, then I would leave you with, with those three things. There it is. And um, <laughs> one, uh, product market fit is, um, again, it's a neat concept. It's okay. If it's working for you for something, keep using it. I don't believe it's the right tool for the job to figure out when you're ready to grow. Secondly, um, I do believe the right tool for that is to figure out how to get an actionable customer segmentation. You can get to an actionable customer segmentation by going through a structured process to work on your positioning. This is how you can get a hold of me. My 20 minutes is up. Thank you.